Hello and welcome to this episode of Midlife Men with me, Philip Briscoe. Today, I'm very pleased to be joined by Richard Popkowski. So Richard has had a very career. He's worked for the uh, US Secret Service, worked for large corporate, and he's also an author. So welcome, Richard. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for the opportunity to be a midlife man. Great. Thank you. Well, Richard, I mentioned you've had a very interesting career. Do you want to start off by talking us through that? Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm a retired special agent with the United States Secret Service, which is a federal law enforcement agency. And the Secret Service is a dual mission agency. So protection of government officials, uh, both visiting foreign heads of state and the U.S. president and, and other senior leaders. And the Secret Service also investigates as a dual mission, primarily financial crimes, very, very involved in uh, cybersecurity now and, you know, combating what's, what's evolving as cyber crimes on the internet and also involved in the protective, protective intelligence world where service monitors threats against these uh, venues and also what is targeted violence now, both domestically and internationally. I know that's a lot of words, Philip, but basically agents conduct criminal investigations and protection. So would it be fair to say then, Richard, that you've had, you know, fairly high levels of high pressure job. You've been, we've been doing very important things, especially, you know, in the Secret Service and, and working in your enforcement capacity. How have you managed the, the high pressure world that you've lived in for, for most of your life? Well, you know, the first thing I'll tell you is men and women in law enforcement, whether you're a, you know, a municipal police officer in a big city or, small town, you know, a state law enforcement officer, people in law enforcement are under constant stress. And it differs from, you know, agency to agency. But, you know, things like working shift work, long hours, in our case, you know, traveling, you know, traveling abroad, traveling traveling domestically. I think all these things contribute to, to the stress that men and women in law enforcement can you know, can, can experience and often do, you know, there is the, I call it the societal stigma for law enforcement that they're, you know, being viewed that there's a fear that they're being viewed as, as weak or not being able to handle their job and their roles and responsibilities. I think that's, you know, one of the things that, you know, is very, you know, true to the profession and, you know, oftentimes, Again, men and women in law enforcement, you know, they're supposed to be 20 feet tall and bulletproof. So, but, but the problems are, you know, enduring stress for a long period of time can often lead to anxiety, depression, or even symptoms that, res, you know, resemble post, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, which, you know, affects them. The military and really people, you know, you know people from different walks of life. You know, you, you, can, you can even see it in a world of uh, medicine, you know, nurses, doctors, you know, technicians who work long hours and although they don't feel the, you know, the, the necessary stresses of someone in law enforcement, but these, these can have what I believe are physiological effects on people, you know, sleeping and eating disorders, you know, fairly withdrawn, self-absorbed, you know, oftentimes maybe even uh, leading to irritability. You know, in your in your personal relationships, and, and even in, in, in the world of, you know, your professional associations as well. So, in in the world, you know, tough world of law enforcement, you know, you've already said you're expected to be, you know, able to to take on a lot of a lot of pressure, taking a lot of things. So, would you say that generally, you know, it, it, there's there's support if you want to discuss or talk about some of these talk about stress and some of the problems associated with the job you know is it is there a stigma against doing that or is it pretty open and supportive so you know my career spanned the 1980s the 1990s and and into the early 2000s and i would say in my era employee assistance programs were were just starting and evolving and I think that 
you know, I, I'll just, you know, comment on my, you know, my experience. Well, I think, first of all, the EAP programs, both in the private sector and the public sector, are wonderful resources. And in the early days, if you engaged with EAP resources, whether it was just a counselor, maybe the provision of social services, you know, as, as, as an ancillary resource, you know, from, you know, people outside the mental health world, even, even just, you know, doctors that would look at, you know, things like diet, nutri- you know, your diet, nutrition, stress management, sleeplessness, you know, those, those, those issues. I think that at, at that, you know, as, as EAP evolved, you know, there was a societal stigma that you could not handle the stresses of your job, which then would indicate that, hey, you know what? Maybe you're not cut out for this line of work. And I think that, you know, early on, there was a lot of reluctance for men and women to get into EAP support programs. Until I would say now, it's, it's not looked upon that way. I, I think, you know, people who engage in, in, in outside help, let's call it, you know, there was the whole confidentiality piece. Uh, there's, you know, the, there should be confidentiality about your engagement uh, with these resources. And I think overall, you know, based on what I hear, what I see, you know, I'm not active duty law enforcement anymore. But I don't think the societal stigma is, is as prevalent as it was in the past. At least that's my opinion. And when we talked before, you talked about the, the, the kind of rubber gun syndrome. Yes, I, I, yeah, I think, you know, that's a term that some people may, may have heard, you know, someone who is experiencing, in law enforcement, someone who is experiencing these types of issues where there's an EAP intervention or even before an EAP intervention, you know, someone in the agency, let's say, you know, usually at a higher level will say, hey, you know, we have to remove this person, you know, from their role, current role, put them in a less stressful role until, you know, perhaps, you know, there's intervention by, you know, by these mental health resources or, or, you know, whatever program is out there to address that person's issue. So what happens then when, you know, you, you don't necessarily feel you can share your, you know, your, your mental health pressures you know, you don't really got the right outlets. What, where? Do, what do you do? What do you do to relieve the stress? Me, me, me personally. Yeah. How did How did that work? Well, so one of the things that works for me and is almost a daily routine for me is fitness. I follow a pretty regimented fitness program, and, and I will say that at my age, which is the shady side of sixty, let's say. The fitness for me is, is I think, my primary outlet for stress and anxiety. I, 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 would, I would consider myself a type A personality, an overachiever. You know, you know my mind works in, in creative ways these days, and fitness is my first. I, I love to ride my bicycle. I, I have a road bike. I live in Cal- Southern California, in the Los Angeles area, and there's a lot of opportunities to ride my bike in different locations, and I take full advantage of it. The The other thing for me is I I write. I'm a writer, debut author. And I also had a unique interest, and in that's making Christmas ornaments. I, I make a Christmas ornament every year for about the last 20 years. And what it helps me do is it's, it's a project, and I have to plan it. You know, some of these take me a couple, three months, you know, to make. And it makes me focus, and it makes me focus on something other than, you know, the stress of everyday life. You know, and I was doing this, you know, even when I was, you know, ending my law enforcement career. So I think for me, I look for diversions. And even in retirement, I worked in corporate security. I, I've done strategic uh, security consulting, some private executive protection. And I, I just... I just find that for me, stepping away from the pressures that I experienced in law enforcement and, and even in, in private sector security, 
just gave me, you know, a different perspective other than living, but, but oftentimes law enforcement officers do, they live at 24 seven and, and can't and I touch. Guess this, and I guess this is where, you know, poor relationships with alcohol and other sorts of, you know, release mechanisms comes into play uh, as a, as a stress reliever. Yes. So, you know, alcohol, alcohol consumption, um, excessive consumption, uh, can sometimes be, uh, a release for people in law enforcement and, and other professions. And, and what it does is sometimes or oftentimes it's an ability to fit in with your peer group. If you spend a lot of time with your colleagues, you know, there's almost like a brotherhood or sisterhood, you know, because you're all living the same life and the same stresses. And, you know, that, that engagement with the alcohol as a release can often lead to, you know, problematic, you know, drinking behaviors, habits. But, you know, alcohol could be, you know, could be viewed as a coping mechanism, I think, for people, you know, that have these professional anxieties. And do you think that's heightened where you've got really high pressure roles, as in, you know, working in, in Secret Service and working in law enforcement and some of the other sectors you talked about? I mean, it's, it, it must be difficult to find ways of not taking the job home. Well, you know, it is. And I think for me, in my experience, what I did, because I, I did have a, a unique law enforcement career and, you know, subjected to all those, you know, potential problems that arise, you know, sleeplessness, working long hours, traveling abroad, coming back, you're in different time zones. You know, when you're, when you're out working in uh, advanced planning for security, there's a lot of responsibility there. And, you don't want to. You don't want to fail. You can't fail in your job because someone's going to get hurt, whether it's a colleague or, you know, someone else at a particular location or event. And ultimately, you know, the people that we are um, charged with protecting. So, th so there's a lot of stress there. And you know, police officers, for instance, you know, it's 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 a little bit of a different stress, I think, because you're dealing with spontaneous events that handle, you know, you have to handle whether it's a radio call to a domestic disturbance situation or, you know, you encounter an accident victim or, you know, worse, you know, a violent crime victim. I think those stresses are very real for the men and women of in law enforcement. And, it, and even at our job, you know, when we work the criminal investigations, you know, oftentimes if you did a search warrant, an arrest warrant, or you were interviewing potential person that wanted to do harm, you know, you were in harm's way and, and or potentially in harm's way. And, you know, dealing with that stress and, and the aftermath, I mean, those were real, those were real, those were realities that we had to deal with. And, and that's where you have to be able to have, you know, to have a, a release when you can from those pressures. And, you know, just try to have a work-life balance. I, I think it's important, you know, for people in law enforcement or, or high-stress jobs or other professions to maintain a work-life balance. And I think that awareness, you know, just around, you know, around the world now is, is, is a prevalent theme, you know, or at least it should be for people. And do you think that can lead to, you know, long-term stress, anxiety, you know, leads to having more severe mental health issues. So do, did you, did you see that more in your profession or? Well, yes. I, I mean, I, I think our world has gotten much more complex than it was, you know, 20 years ago, 15, 20, 10, 15, 20 years ago. You know, with, with the advent of social media, instant communication these days, I, I think the stresses that particularly, you know, men and women in law enforcement encounter today 
you know, could be different uh, than they would have been, you know, 10 years ago. So, you know, being able to, uh, awareness is, you know, awareness is the first thing. And then, and even when an individual is not aware, having someone that can be sensitive, you know, to, to someone who might need help and then, and then provide, you know, encouragement to, you know, to take advantage of getting help. So you talked earlier about coping mechanisms and you personally, you know, use exercise to help relieve stress, but you've also been writing for most of your life and, you know, you're, you're a new, published your debut, debut novel. So how did, you, how did you, how did writing become part of your life then? You know, what's the journey your journey to, to now being a published author? So, so, you know, I've always had a creative mind and, and, you know, I, I'll just say something about my father. You know, my father has been like to see snow for over 20 years. And, you know, he came from Poland, you know, born in Poland, as was my mother. And my dad, you know, lived through, my parents lived through World War II, which, which of course, you know, was, was a horrific, you know, horrific time for, for everyone. And he was a very practical, pragmatic man. Worked worked as a, a printer. You know, he was a printer. That was his his, his his career, his profession. But then he was also an artist. He was very creative. He loved to do oil paintings and watercolors and you know pen and ink etchings. And and I think for him it was a release. I remember as a boy. You know, he would go down in our basement and had his easel and, you know, he'd light up a cigarette and, and he would just stand there and paint. And I would, I would sit there and watch him, you know, as did, you know, my, my sisters. And I just saw, you know, I thought it was an escape for him. Obviously, he was very talented. And, and I think I inherited some of his abilities. You know, I, I don't, do all have paintings, but I've done some drawing and, and for me, it's the manual, the, you know, the Christmas ornaments. I think that's my release, you know, my escape. And it gives me an ability to express my creative talents. Now, with regard to writing, I started writing, I think, you know, like any, any kid, you know, you have to write stories in grammar school. And I, I, I actually had a writing class in high school. So I had short stories, and then in college, I, in university in Chicago, I took a couple of writing courses. And I think my professors back then, because I, you know, I wanted to go into law enforcement. And by the way, I was going to be—I wanted to be a police officer. Early on, I studied criminal justice in college at, at Loyola University in Chicago, and I, you know, I, I eventually ran wrote very detailed reports in, in, in law enforcement and the creative writing, even in college, one of my professors said, he goes, I did a short story. He gave me an A on and I'm like, wow. And then his comments were, I remember his name, Dr. Macy. And he said, did you really write this? And <laughs> I, took that, I took that as a compliment. So I really didn't do any creative writing until just after I retired, you know, 20 years ago. And I just had, I think along the way, I had ideas that were formulating in my head. And I, I had this idea for my novel. I'll, I'll hold it up, the walk on. See my name. You can see a couple of images there. That's my protagonist, Mike, the steel man, Stavowski. He was carrying a, a, a football helmet. And this is a downtown Chicago. He's walking along the lakefront along an area they call Oak Street Beach. And this young lady, as a part of the story, very prominent, and her name was Kim, and that's all I'll tell you. But this is a, a story of redemption, personal redemption for this person. And it involves romance, tragedy, some lighthearted moments. I just got a five-star review, so I'm happy about that. But for me, that story popped into my head and began really, really engaging it out of my thought. 2007, so over 16 years ago. And that was at a time when professional athletes, especially in the world of uh, professional football, seemed to be stories appearing in the media, you know, some, some athletes making some very poor choices. And it, it gave me the, the impetus uh, for the story. 
And I just built characters, you know, real life characters based on the city that I grew up in. And I was told, you know, by the people that are accomplished authors said, hey, write what you know. So I read what I know. And, and it took me, it was, a, it was a journey. I was raising, you know, two kids, working full time, you know, in, in my other uh, private sector jobs. And I would often write late at night, sometimes early in the morning, or catch as catch can. And it took me, you know, it took me a long time. I walked away from, from, from it uh, for three years and then decided to finish it when uh, I had an opportunity. Kids went away to college and um, uh, I was fortunate, you know, to have a publisher uh, believe in the story. And then uh, the debut novel came out this past February. Now, in the interim, I have also written some short stories. I, I wrote another story completely opposite of this novel, and it's a, a holiday, a Christmas romantic comedy titled Operation Santa Bear. And it's about a police officer and, and a nurse, and a uh, pretty formulaic romantic comedy that I'm hoping to, you know, to push to the next level. And then I'm also working on a crime story now, and it's kind of loosely based on my experiences as a task force supervisor in the Secret Service where I worked with other uh, law enforcement agencies, you know, federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies were mission-oriented and were some pretty complex criminal investigations. So I guess writing for me has evolved into what is a passion now, and I, I intend to continue to write as, as time, time allows. And it seems like my creative creative juices are really, you know, boiling up now. And I opened up Pandora's box. So let, let's see where it goes from here. And how much is, how much you said, you know, you, you should write what you know, or well, the advice was to write what you know. How much of you is in the, uh, the protagonist in the war? Okay. So as I tell people, there's some of my DNA and my protagonist, you know, and I, you know, I don't want to give the story away, but my my character works in a high pressure, works, you know, as a professional athlete, you know, constant media scrutiny, good and bad, uses alcohol and, you know, banned substances, let's say, to maintain his level of play, you know, late in his career. So he's subjected to the trials and tribulations and stresses you know, anxiety of being a professional athlete, as well as, you know, physical, the physical toll it takes on uh, one's, you know, one's body. So I guess in a roundabout manner, what I'm trying to say, Philip, instead of telling the time I'm building the clock here, but yeah, there's some of my DNA and there's a lot of, in writing what I know, you know, I tried to put my character, other characters, and experiences and, and locations that, that I know well. Did you find it a kind of cathartic experience writing the novel? I would say yes. Yes, on, on several fronts. You know, I incorporated things like my protagonist's uh, fathers from, you know, from Europe, you know, from Poland, obviously. He's got a Polish last name, Stolowski. Blue collared kid, you know, grew up in the you know, steel mill areas of Chicago. Steel, steel mill area where, there, where, where steel was produced, and a lot of uh, a lot of immigrants actually worked there. You know, from the mid eighteen hundreds until I'd say the late nineteen seventies when the mills shut down. Very tight knit neighborhood. But as far as catharsis, obviously, this this story popped into my head. And, you know, the overall theme of personal redemption, and I framed it, you know, I, I framed the story around a professional athlete who was subjected to all these stresses and anxieties, physical manifestations. And I think um, it, was, it was cathartic for me. You know, I, I think I had a story inside I had to tell, and this is what came out. So... What advice would you have, based on your experience, to people listening to this podcast 
you know, they're working maybe they're working in high pressure environments, struggling to cope with you know the associated stress, maybe starting to have an impact on their their mental health. You know, what advice would you give them based on your experience? You know, what are they? Sh- what should they do? Well, I think I think the overall comment that I have there is people oftentimes around you can see things that you don't and and understand that you're being affected by, you know, whatever it is, you know, it could be alcohol, it could be the use of illicit drugs, you know, it could be being withdrawn, you know, you're not the same that you were or, or should be. And then oftentimes it's family members or close friends or professional associates, supervisors, etc. And I think that what I would advise, advise, you know, people in the situation is if somebody tells you that you need help or you need some type of intervention, some type of support, you should internalize it. But sometimes people don't know that they need help. But I would encourage everyone that if there are warning signs that someone's telling you about, you know, there may be a comment on there that I haven't. You should take advantage of it, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And, you know, the societal stigmas, I think, have dissipated quite a bit for an, ind- for an individual. Another thing that, that's happened, and it seems, I don't know, the, as a result maybe of all the, you know, the things that I was experienced uh, in the last few years with COVID, it, it seems like um, suicides, you know, suicides, uh, at least I've seen in the world of law enforcement, especially with those men and women that experience the more concerning side, you know, the, the violent crime, the, you know, people that themselves might need, you know, mental health support. This can, this can lead, you know, to the individual in law enforcement to not be able to cope. And, and you do see, you know, I, I don't want to quote statistics because I'm, you know, I'm not that well informed, I, you know, but there is, there is open source information out there, you know, about, you know, suicide being a, a concern, you know, for men and women and law enforcement potential concern. And the fact that intervention and support is out there. And these, you know, these, these individuals should heed the warning signs and, and take advantage of, of getting help, which most often is, is the answer that someone may need. Thank you, Richard. Um, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for telling us about your career. Great to hear about your book, and hopefully we'll, we'll see more to come. I have an author's website. It's richardpodkowski.com. If anyone is interested in reading about the reviews, which I'm getting, and learn a little bit more about myself, the uh, book is also available for purchase through the website. It's on Amazon, Barnes & Noble Books, a couple other uh, platforms. Thank you. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Midlife Men, where my guest has been Richard Pukowski. If you want to find out more about Richard, you can visit his website, richardpodkowski.com, where you can also buy his debut novel, The Walk On, or you can also buy it through most online retailers, and we'll put the links on the website. If you have a suggestion for a topic you'd like us to cover in the podcast, or if you have a story you'd like to share, then please contact me either on Twitter at MidlifeMen or email me at midlifemen01 at gmail.com. Join me next time when we talk to other midlife men about their stories, and maybe you'll find that they resonate with you. Thank you.